Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar from MBS, What Specifiers uh, Want. So these are the results from our product information survey uh, 2023. Uh, the webinar lasts uh, 40 minutes, 50 minutes. Uh, everybody's on mute, but we would love as many questions as possible. And we'll sort of uh, respond to all of these after the session. So please use the, the question box on the screen if you've got any questions or observation. Uh, with me today, we have uh, David Bain, Research Manager at MBS, who will uh, start the session by presenting the findings. And then we'll discuss the findings with uh, Preti Dalawal from uh, EPR Architects, a specification consultant, and also Nick Greenwood from Maber Architects, who's an architectural designer. And then the third part of the session will be a little bit of a close uh, from um, myself. So let's uh, get straight into it. And I'll hand over to David Bain, Research Manager at MBS. David. Thanks, Stephen. Hi, everybody. I'm David Bain, Research Manager at MBS, and I'm going to take you through the findings of the What Specifiers Want report, um, which are the results from the product information survey that we've just done um, a few months ago. So this is one of our industry surveys that we do um, every year, and this one focuses on what specifiers working in the UK want from uh, product information um, and support from, from suppliers and manufacturers and people that provide that kind of information to help them make the right kind of decisions on their projects. So just going to tell you a bit about the survey. So we carried out the survey at the end of last year, um, around November time through to mid-January, and we had a really nice response of just under 600 UK respondents and they were primarily designers, consultants and, and specifiers um, working in construction in the UK. So almost half worked in an architectural practice. Uh, you can see 48% were in architectural practice and we also had good representation from other people working in uh, similar fields. So quite a lot of people in multidisciplinary organisations, uh, quite a few people working in engineering practices, um, also local authority. Um, a few people in, in construction firms. So a good kind of representation of people that um, need and use product information um, in the course of their work. We had a good range of organisation sizes uh, from people who are uh, sole practitioners or micro practices of just a couple of people, right up to organisations with over 500 people working in them, um, that, that may well be working in multiple offices, potentially internationally as well. And in terms of the, the individual people that took part, um, quite a lot of people were working in architectural professions. So we've grouped these together here, but the 62% there comprise of architects as the biggest group, but also architectural technologists, technicians and landscape architects. Um, and then as with the organisations, we've got quite a lot of people who are working in engineering roles, building surveyors, quantity surveyors, um, and also those um, in sort of specialist BIM and CAD roles. Uh, and then we also have a few other people who work in different types of discipline as well that contribute. So people like um, project managers um, and people working in construction firms as well. We've got a range of ages and um, genders represented. So um, just, just telling us really that we're, we're capturing views from people um, of different experience from um, different backgrounds. So just with these, we're, we're trying to represent the industry as well as we can. And then in terms of the, the kind of work that people are doing, we wanted to make sure that we um, understood the kind of tasks that people were carrying out uh, in respect to product information. Um, so we can see here that 78% uh, specify products where they, where they name the manufacturer. Uh, what we might term as prescriptive specification, and they, they do that in the course of their work. So, so the majority of people, you know, might be saying that they want to use this particular brand of, of window or door, for example, um, in their projects. Um, it doesn't mean they do that um, for every decision. Uh, it just means they do that for in the course of their work. Um, so you can also see there's, there's quite a lot of overlap in that 70% of people uh, will specify more descriptively where they're not necessarily always naming the manufacturer. Um, and uh, th this, these all vary depending on the type of project that people are working on. So perhaps if they're working in the public sector where then they're not naming 
um, products, um, and leaving the decision to the contractor. That might be the case for some projects, but for other projects, they might be um, you know, really keen to specify you know, every different product um, in, 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 in lots of detail and, and, and by, by brand. Um, there are some differences uh, depending on the, the person that took to part in the survey. So for some, we found that um, the small organizations are more likely to specify um, by specific manufacturer. So more keen to make those, those decisions. Um, and also we found that more architects tended to do that as well. Um, a lot of people were involved in researching products in their role, as, as you might expect. So finding out you know, the right product for the, for the particular use in hand. Um, and then there are other people who are perhaps less hands-on, but oversee projects. Um, and a few people who actually are involved in procuring them. So perhaps the, the, those in sort of more um, contracting roles or QSs. So I want to talk um, in this section about how people access product information and how they would like to do that. So we asked people um, which sources of information they, uh, they, they tend to use. Um, so there's some things here probably not that surprising. So that the top things that come out are internet search engines like Google and supplier websites. And these, these have consistently been um, the, the top places that people look to when they're sourcing product information, when we've asked these questions in surveys over the years. Um, search engines are you know, often the starting point for, for, for most of us, for things that we want to go and find out. So you know, quite often that's where people will go initially. Um, and that search result might then lead them to a manufacturer's website, but it also might lead them to places like MBS Source, for example, where they can then go um, and, and browse and search for, for products and manufacturers there. So quite often, I think that's the first place they'll go and then they'll go off somewhere else. Quite often, some of the sources that are shown here in this diagram. Um, we also wanted to, to point out that we think some of the things coming through here suggest that kind of structured technical information is particularly important for, um, for designers and specifiers. So you can see that 63%, so they get information from uh, manufacturers, technical reps. So, you know, that, that's you know, nearly two thirds of people that took part in the survey said that. Um, and people do get information from manufacturer sales reps too, but, but it's not as high as 42%. Um, we also find that uh, not far off two thirds of people were using online product information libraries um, where they can get specific specification clauses or BIM and digital objects and things like that. So, so sources, things like MBS source and, and places like that where you can get that kind of technical information. Um, and then we also found that there are some people saying they get the information for specification platforms as well. So 41% um, mentioned that. Uh, let other, other sources of perhaps kind of less structured um, information, like journals, magazines, trade shows, exhibitions, things like that, they were mentioned as, as, as sources for some people, um, but not as high as the others. Uh, and perhaps I think you know, the pandemic's probably had some effect on that where in-person trade shows, you know, dropped off during that time. And even though um, there, there were online equivalents and a lot of the trade shows have come back, um, that, that may have had an, had an effect perhaps. Um, and they're not, they're not the top sort of reasons now. So I, I mentioned source earlier. So some people talked about how they use MBS source to um, find information about the, the products they want to specify. So the survey uh, wasn't just MBS customers, you know, we, we, we sought to, to speak to a representative group of people across the industry um, and we found among those just over half said that they used source to, to find information. Um, that actually increased among some groups, so technologists and technicians, 71% of those said they used source and 66% of architects said that they did. Um, and you can see by this comment here, you know, that, that um, people are really keen for manufacturers to provide uh, t technical information like digital objects and those kind of things. Uh, and they're saying here, you know, they, they like the information to be on source. So we did actually ask uh, specifically whether people would recommend it. And you can see that 69% of specifiers said they would recommend a to a manufacturer that they include their products on source. Um, and again, that, that went up for some groups. So technologists in particular, 80% uh, of those said that they would recommend to a manufacturer to put their information on source. Um, and also those who were um, uh, a bit earlier in their 
their careers of um, sort of younger age groups were more likely to recommend it as well, which might be reflective of the fact that you know, younger age groups have broadly, uh, I guess, been more used to using digital sources of information and kind of grown up with those uh, as, a, as a first place to look for things. So what do they value the most? Um, again, sort of talking about technical information, you know, you can see here that um, those kinds of sources come through as, as really valuable sources. So product data sheets in particular, 78% of people said that they they most value that format of product information. So that's that's quite a way above all of the other uh, types of information that they might want to, to use. Specification clauses come next, uh, with 44% saying they most value those. But you can see there's quite a few kind of clustered around that, that sort of number. So CAD details too, um, in terms of other sort of technical information. Um, again, digital objects are then a little bit further down. Um, certification is important. Um, but then also things like you would expect, you know, pictures and images of the product. Clearly, that, that's, that's important. And, and some for some products in particular, that's going to be really key. Um, samples, uh, not, not so high up. But again, for, I think for some types of product where people need to perhaps, you know, handle it, feel the texture of something, uh, you know, they're going to be particularly important for some products, maybe more important for some than others. Uh, things like brochures, um, you know, which have uh, often been a kind of key source of information perhaps in the past, a little bit further down. Um, so that's not something that specifiers are saying they perhaps value as much as some of the other sources. Uh, so that's something to think about if people are trying to work out how best to sort of spend their budgets over, you know, over the next year. Kind of year or two and especially with things perhaps being a little bit tight uh, you know imagine people are having to make some decisions with the um, some priority decisions um, with the way things are with the the economy at the moment just want to talk a bit more about bim and digital objects um, so you can see that um, 69 percent of people feel that they need manufacturers to provide them with with objects for their products so you know, just over two thirds of people say that that's something which they really want them to do. Um, but I think it's the comments that people made in the survey which really kind of kind of hit home the, the point about how much these are valued among a, a lot of specifiers. So, you know, included a few here, but there were, there were more than this. So people were saying, you know, they, they, they liked more BIM objects. They want more kind of choice of, of um, objects and digital files. Um, and some people are saying, you know, if there is an object for the, for the product, they're more likely to specify it. Um, and people also use the opportunity to say what they thought um, a good BIM or digital object looked like, you know, and what kind of qualities that might have. So some do see some objects available with better quality than others. Um, so I think it's got to have the right kind of information associated with it, um, but the most relevant, or useful technical information. And, and not. we often hear feedback from people saying they don't want too much information in there or too much data which is going to make the file too large and too sort of difficult to use and slow down the overall model so there are you know those kind of things to think about when when creating and providing uh, BIM objects okay so we went on to ask a bit more about certification um, and how important that might be particularly in kind of view of what's happening in the legislative environment with um, uh, you know the, the more stringent uh, controls and um, things coming in with the Building Safety Act. So we asked here about whether certification was important for safety critical products um, and also whether it was important for you know all products generally um, and you can see here that for safety critical products it's clearly um, really important so um, you can see that 55% said it was essential for safety critical products um, but not necessarily others however a third are saying it's essential for all products so if you put those together, you basically got nine out of 10 people saying um, that it's essential for safety critical products. So it's really key to have that third party certification. And, and people are talking about things like, you know, BBA Agremont certification and things like that. Um, and that for some people, I think that's seen as being more important than perhaps a kind of more kind of glossy brochure promoting the, the, the product. We then went to ask about um, environmental product declaration specifically is, is something which seems to have gained momentum recently and, and be, be talked about quite a lot something which is you know quite important for for people that are using product information um, and you can see here that this, this figures kind of bear that out really that um, 
well over 80 percent um, yeah, are, are close to 90 percent say that they are important um, and a third say they're very important and we had quite a lot of comments about this um, um, with people saying you know, they really want this these, this type of information and it, it can be frustrating if they can't get get access to it and that can help them then make decisions about um, things like um, you know embodied carbon or understand how much embodied carbon is in the products they might want to specify and then try to make decisions which help them work towards a more kind of zero carbon sustainable way of working which obviously the, you know we're all trying to move towards so so anything that um, suppliers and manufacturers can do to help provide this information to specifiers is going to help them make those decisions um, more confidently uh, and I guess if, if, if you're a manufacturer that is providing that kind of information um, you know that can be an advantage for you um, when um, when trying to kind of get to um, your product specified. And just following on with that theme, you know, the, the survey wasn't about sustainability, but um, given that it's such an important topic, we wanted to just understand a bit more about um, people's keenness to supply uh, to specify sustainably. Um, and you can see, you know, that there are some people, a kind of core of specifiers that pretty much always specify the most sustainable product. And they might even do that if they're compromising a bit on, on price and potentially performance. So, um, you know, if, if they're having, if, if the client's having to pay more, it's going to be more expensive for the project. Um, they still may, may specify those options. But most people are kind of in this middle group where they'll, they'll, they'll try to, they'll usually specify the most sustainable um, product. You know, but if that, but if there's a big compromise on performance or it's much more expensive, then they, they may, you know, not necessarily be able to do that. Um, what's quite encouraging is that there's very few people who just say they won't look at it. You know, that they'll just focus on price and performance. So only seven percent said that. So, so it does suggest that, you know, everybody pretty much is is, is trying to find ways to specify the most sustainable options. Um, what we obviously need to see is that any any potential gap between um, sustainable options and in terms of performance and price closes. So thinking of all the information that people want, how easy is it for them to find it? So the kind of positive story here is that uh, a majority of people, just over half, do say it is easy to find the information. Um, the, the, the less positive story is that if you look at, at this compared to when we asked it about four years ago, nothing seems to have changed that much. Um, and there aren't very many people saying it's very easy to find the information. Um, but there are a few people that are saying it's difficult. So it's not that it's really, really hard to find, you know, good, accurate information that people need. It just needs to be easier. And there were quite a lot of comments about that in the survey. So you can see here, you know, the kind of things people were saying. So someone saying, you know, it should be as easy as um, using an iPhone. Uh, you know, so that was a game changer when it came about. And you know, people want to very, very quickly and easily find the information they need without having to sort of search around for it. Um, and some of that can be about making websites you know, more accessible or easier to navigate to find the information very quickly. Okay, so I wanted to move on to talk a bit about um, specification and some, some, some particular themes relating to that. So one of the things we wanted to look at was specifying complex systems. So with perhaps a, a simpler component of product, specifiers may find it perhaps uh, more straightforward to use the information that they, they've got to hand and, and specify it themselves. But with a more complex system, with a lot of things to think about um, within that, that you know, it may be um, that they need more assistance to do that. And we wanted to understand that better. So you can see here that there's, there's quite, a, quite a range of approaches. Um, there are some people just under a quarter who did say they, they, you know, they are generally happy to make the decision themselves and specify themselves, but more people felt it was better to, to kind of get the advice from specialists. So 35% said they actually tended to leave the decision to a specialist subcontractor um, who would then tend to, you know, make the final choice, perhaps you know, do the final design, specify um, the system themselves. And then we also found a set, the same percentage like to work collaboratively with the manufacturer or supplier. So, you know, they would, they would contact them, um, provide some information about the project, perhaps have meetings or, or phone calls about it, and then work on on the, the specification together in a collaborative way, which is obviously really positive for the industry, which historically hasn't 
perhaps always been as collaborative as we might want it to be. So you know, collaboration is something that we're really supportive of at MBS, and it's something that the chorus can help uh, to enable. So 62% uh, of the people that did this survey um, used chorus to specify products. And, and within Chorus, um, you can work on a specification together. So uh, a, a designer, a specifier can invite other people in, like manufacturers or suppliers, um, into their live specification. Um, and the manufacturer can then actually complete um, the relevant part of the specification for their product within that document, within the, that live, you know, cloud-based online document. And the, the specifier can can then, you know, obviously look at that and they can work together on it to finalise it. So that, that's something we're we're enabling in, in Chorus, in supporting the way that a lot of people are working. So I wanted to talk a bit about substitution. It's always a, you know, an important theme. Um, and again, particularly with some of the changes that happen in the regulatory environment and the importance of you know, documenting um, what's been specified, any changes to that, what's being installed in the building and supporting the, the golden thread and so on. Um, so we've been trying to monitor um, how often this happens. Um, you can see that it's still, you know, a common thing. 35% said that substitution often happened on their projects in the last year, um, and nearly half said it happened sometimes. So there's, there's very few people saying it, it doesn't happen on the projects they work on. Um, I think it's recognised that value engineering is part of the process. Um, contractors may have good reasons for recommending alternatives. Um, you know, sometimes they might actually be able to put forward a, a better alternative that performs at least as well as the initial one and you can see in the chart on the right that um, specifiers acknowledge that a, um, a better alternative met the, the performance criteria. Uh, it's about just over a third of people said that. But the biggest reason remains that there's a cheaper alternative available, um, which is perhaps not surprising, you know, again, given the last couple of years with, with um, supply shortages and really kind of high inflation on materials. So, so contractors will be looking to kind of manage that and, and um, maintain a margin. What we have found is that that supply shortage is recognised there. So uh, the, that, that reason um, of products not being available has gone up to 47% compared to a third on, on the previous time we asked this. Um, but one of the things we'd emphasize here for um, you know for, for people is that um, where manufacturers and specifiers work together um, and provide and put together the specification um, that can help to make sure it's accurate and complete and up to date um, and if that's the case then you know that can help to some extent I think for the specification to stick if you like because uh, the contract has all the information that they need and is perhaps less likely to go elsewhere. So the, the last section I wanted to cover um, was about working towards a safe a future, um, kind of reflecting what was happening at the moment with the Building Safety Act and the changes that have come in our, and are coming in over the next year. And we wanted to understand how people, kind of how confident people were, how, how clear they were about the changes and how it might affect them. So in terms of the Building Safety Act, um, how clear were people about it? So to, first of all, um, how clear were they about the types of product project that are kind of sort of said to fall within the scope of the act? Um, so you can see here that a majority did feel clear about it. 69% said they're clear about the types of project, um, but 26% um, said they weren't clear. So quite a few are unsure about it. Um, and this really reflects the kind of focus of the act to, to a certain extent on the um, kind of high risk, high rise and high risk residential buildings. Um, then we'll sort of talk about what the the responsibilities of the duty holders um, are for the three gateways that are being introduced. Um, and um, you can see here that, that fewer people are clear about that. So 43% um, said that they're, they're not clear uh, about the responsibilities of duty holders there. Um, while we can see that, you know, just over a majority um, are clear. And, and it's a similar um, proportion for people feeling like they would be sure what their about what their responsibilities would be if they did a project which was which fell within the act. So 57% said they would be clear and again that 43% um, said they were not clear. So in a way that's kind of understandable because the, the secondary legislation is still being finalised and the exact details of what people will need to do is still being finalised and um, and as that information gets released um, soon, 
then then then, then hopefully that's going to help people be more clear about what their responsibilities are. Um, but there does seem to be a bit of debate about um, you know, exactly what the Act covers in terms of project scope. While the focus is on high-rise residential buildings, um, you know, it, it, the, the legislation and what may be uh, introduced uh, secondary legisl legislation could well affect all projects. I mean, it's interesting that you've got some different points of view. The top comment on the right there says it's not really going to affect us. We don't do that type of work, whereas the next one down says actually, look, it's going to affect everything. So it's so quite interesting how what people's take on, on this is. Um, so in, in terms of the secondary legislation and what that's going to mean in practice for people, um, the golden thread has been talked about a lot in terms of, you know, this need to maintain uh, good, a good record and documentation of specifications and other information and what changes throughout the project. Um, so essentially people know what has been put in that building before it gets handed over to the, to the managers of the, of the building. Um, we've been asking people whether they feel they need to work digitally um, in respect of this information to comply with the golden thread and therefore with the regulations. Um, most people think they do. So you can see 70% um, feel they need to work digitally, but it's not everybody. And it's actually slightly lower than last time we asked this in 2021. So a little bit of concern that some people feel they don't necessarily need to do that. Um, so that's one to watch. Um, and then being clear about what they would need to do to comply. Um, it's kind of hovered around half feeling that they're, they're clear about that. So again, it's quite a few people um, sort of needing to get up to speed with what they need to do. Uh, and again, that's probably going to be helped by, you know, more guidance and information coming out from, from government and others uh, this year. So related to that, um, you know, the need to verify that what's been specified has been, been installed, or at least that if it's, if it's something's been changed, then what, what was installed in the building. Um, so did, did specifiers do that as, as part of their work? So we, we asked that question for traditional projects and contractor-led projects. And you can see for traditional ones, 23% of people said they always verified what was installed. So, you know, encouraging that nearly a quarter of people were doing that. Excuse me. And 45% and, um, said they were doing it most of the time. So, so that's often, that's obviously something which is happening uh, for a lot of projects, but, but it's not happening for all of them. So this is obviously something that we're going to be wanting to move towards more as the regulations come in and um, it gets made more clear about what people do need to, to verify and document. Um, and then the, the final questions we asked about were about the kind of culture of the industry and, um, and whether it's changing for the better. So, so Dame Judith Hackett has talked about the need for, for culture change. Um, and that this is something that needs to be happening now rather than just waiting for all the, the legislation to be finalised. So we wanted to get a sense of whether people working in the industry did think that that, that was happening um, and things were getting better. So the figures here suggest there's a kind of tentative sense that the industry has improved in the last few years in terms of the quality of information provided. Um, so you can see that, that it is a majority, over half, um, felt that the accuracy and quality of construction product information has improved in the last five years. So it's uh, about 63% uh, are saying that. Um, but there are quite a few people who aren't sure, and there are a few people who do disagree with that. Um, and then in terms of just a, a more positive culture, you know, moving away from this kind of race to the bottom, if you like, um, you know, there's quite a few people who agree that's the case, but it is slightly under half, 47%. Um, and then even more people are quite unsure about that, kind of sat in the middle and a few people disagree that things have improved. Uh, and we've included a couple of comments here which talk about how people feel in their own words. And you can see it's, it's kind of quite a mixture of people sort of saying, you know, there's, there's perhaps a will to, to, to do things sort of better, um, but, but money is still king. Budgets have been sort of tight with the current, the economic climate over the last couple of years, and that can make things quite difficult in terms of specifying more sustainably at least. Um, you would hope that safety is still always paramount. Um, and that actually as legislation comes in, it's going to put more pressures in some ways on people because there's more they need to understand, more information um, that people need to be aware of. So, you know, perhaps a tentative um, sort of view that the picture has changed um, for the better, but, but certainly, you know, a way to go, I think. So I just wanted to finish by summarising a few of the, the key things that we feel have come out of this survey. I think a really kind of obvious but, but clear point is that, you know, that there's, there's a lot of change 
there's, there's a lot of change in the industry anyway with new products innovations and new regulations but with this particular new legislation coming in um, and what that's going to mean there's even more for people to keep up to date with um, more information that they need to uh, to access and understand um, so specifiers want you know, really easy access to structured technical digital data that, that's going to help them create the specifications and make the right decisions um, and then and then work with the rest of the project team to kind of communicate and, and, and pass that to the relevant people so the, the building can be built in the right way um, that also includes having good certification and EPDs um, and, and essentially just needs to be easier for them to find this information uh, many specifiers want to and, and do work collaboratively with suppliers to specify the best solution for the projects. That's great. Um, and, and I guess we want to see sort of more of that and for manufacturers and suppliers, you know, for them to be able to kind of tap into that and, and work with specifiers. Um, you know, that, that's a good thing for, for them, a good thing for specifiers, a good thing for the industry and, and outcomes, I think, generally. Um, and, and we would, you know, the spirit of collaboration should help to improve the culture. Um, and the industry and, and project outcomes more generally. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand back to Stephen now. Thank you very much, David. Uh, great presentation. Uh, we're now going to move on to the next part of the webinar where uh, we're joined uh, by Pretty from EPR and Nick from Maber, just to discuss uh, what, what are their opinions uh, when they looked at the findings from the report. Uh, before we do that, I just let uh, Pretty say a few words about herself and EPR. Hello, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm from EPR Architects, and um, so we uh, have a studio in London, uh, Poland, and Manchester, uh, just above. I think it's uh, close to three hundred staff now, um, and uh, we do um, really mix. Uh, buildings, hotels, resi offices, even high-end refurbs as well. Um, part of the REN and we, yeah, we fully uh, rivet an MBS uh, Chorus Uniclass as uh, what we work with um, and BIM certified. Well, this is a bit about uh, us. Thanks. And then uh, Nick, Nick, yourself. Oh, yeah, Nick, Nick Greenwood from uh, Maybra Architects. Um, 75 staff located across the Midlands and, and uh, London practices. Um, pleased to say AJ Top 100. Uh, we work in Archicad and Chorus, obviously, and we're also a, a member of uh, the REN um, as Pretties. Yes. Yeah, the first, uh, well, one of David's slides, I thought that was just worth looking at again. I remember when I joined. NBS, we had this huge room downstairs that was just full of standards and manufacturers literature. And every week there'd be a big pile of posts coming through the, the, the door. And that was how a lot of our information was managed. Do, do you agree that the world's changed and it's all now sort of well-structured information that's accessible digitally when it comes to manufacturer information, Pretty. Um, yes, I think uh, what uh, the survey results really does reflect how it is nowadays. Uh, we do tend to look uh, online first and then um, the technical data that we can get like from the reps and the specifications um, as well. So um, yeah, that kind of really does uh, truly reflect how it is now. And I guess Nicholas, uh... The example I always think of in my head is when I was like buying a house or buying a car. You used to go to your estate agents and get a whole set of paper and put it on the floor. It's not just construction, but is it digital first now for construction uh, for you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, our our um, hard copy library is pretty much gone, you know, so we'll we'll do the research online first, um, you know, select the materials and order just one or two samples that we need to, to put in front of clients and, and planners. So yeah, it's, um, it's, it's really kind of reduced right down and it is pretty much all online now. Yeah. And I'm, again, just looking at that other industry, like in a state agent or uh, a car a manufacturer would have a great website, but they'd also put their information on it with sort of directory site like right move or auto trader would, would you say that's a, sort of a, a similar situation with manufacturers and nbs source uh, nick yeah yeah definitely you know we uh you know we're, we're keen to see that 
that information on MBS source. And, you know, generally if it's there, it, it gets specified if, if it's the right product at the right time. Yeah. And just just moving on to, so there's that core sort of technical information like how the product performs, what certificate it's got, et cetera. In terms of the additional information that manufacturers may provide, uh, BIM digital objects still came through uh, quite quite strongly. We've had a sort of decade of, of BIM. How important are objects to, to yourself, uh, Preppy at EPR? Um, so I think um, uh, definitely, I mean, BIM objects are uh, quite important, especially for BIM projects um, where we do need all that data. I think manufacturers are definitely becoming better in this. I think um, I think initially it was more, you know, BIM team is becoming more, um, well, we were more, um, you know, neutral and uh, more generic objects and didn't want so much of information. But I think um, manufacturers are providing better uh, information embedded, and um, it should be useful information, really. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, then that's what we would use really now, and such as COBE data. And uh, yeah. And Nick, Nick, yourself, you've used AutoCAD for a number of years. How do you get the relationship between getting the right objects inside the, the 3D model and linking that to the specification so everything's all aligned. Yeah, so um, obviously we're, we're, we're using the, the link between um, Archicad and, and Chorus. So, um, you know, connecting that um, that specification information to, to the model information. You know, the BIM objects are becoming more and more critical to, you know, uh, initially the kind of um, client coordination. So showing the client what the spaces are actually going to look like with these objects in. And then for the more detailed technical coordination with uh, M&E consultants further down the line. Yeah, yeah. And I, the other thing that really stood out for me, sort of listening to David and like seeing an advanced copy of his presentation as well, was the, the sort of rise and rise of environmental product declarations. So two or three years ago, I'd, I'd barely heard of th these, and this it's the hot topic every week on LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, uh, our manufacturers are putting more and more uh, content online and source. Maybe to, to Nick first, is, is this something you're seeing in Maybe where you're demanding EPDs from manufacturers? Uh, certainly one of the most recent projects I've been involved with, it was a, a low to zero carbon uh, cadet training facility. You know, we were we were looking for this type of information, um, but in all honesty, you know, struggling to find it and struggling to find um, EPDs and BBA certificates. You know, so it was um, difficult, but um, you know they are becoming more prevalent, and we are we are starting to look for them more and more. And pretty, if, if a manufacturer is looking for a differential, say the performance is 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 similar, is having like well-structured sustainability information, something that you think helps them get specified? Um, yes, I think nowadays because, you know, we are looking for that. And I think, um, for example, the EPD certificate is asked for in the BREM, you know, requirement. But um, besides that, I think if you are looking at, you know, well or any other certifications it's really of like why you're actually looking for that as well uh, I mean for example EPD certificate doesn't mean that um, it's a sustainable product it's just really um, having information of the life cycle of the product so what exactly are you looking for and why do you need a certificate but those all of those things uh, are becoming more and more important um, to look at as well yeah so I guess it's it's true that just having an EPD certificate doesn't mean I've got a sustainable product. It's it's declaring like metrics inside there. Do you, do you want to almost want to see those metrics get digitalized from inside the EPD? Um, yes, I think the data that is in there, that's what we do need to look at. And uh, yeah, having those available and um, well, it's all about being structured and having that, you know, kind of standardized information and certificates for those that makes it easier to look at and compare. And uh, that's exactly what's important to look at, yes. And, and David, uh, you're uh, joining us here for the discussion as well. 
we've been doing these surveys for over 10 years now. Would you say finally the sort of sustainability demands are coming from the industry now? Um, I think there are some things which suggest suggest that. I think I think the designer and designer and specifier community has always been really keen to specify sustainably, I think. Um, so I think any opportunity to do that, I think a lot of people will will, will do if they can within the, the scope of their project. Um, but um, you know, but there there is a sense that um, there's some momentum gathering, um, and there's I, th I think they need information to help them do it, and I think they need a, a will from clients to to also enable projects to be sustainable. So there are some signs here that more of that's happening. I think. Yeah, I, th I think for me the big difference is exactly what you say there about the, the will from clients are almost the, the the government bodies or local authority bodies. So a bit like the London plan. You've got to actually declare your, your, your carbon or your, your big private clients that run the stock markets have to do ESG declarations every year. And I, I think that sort of real pull factor is, is, is really starting, starting to see that that, that, that that happen. I think the next slide is on sustainable products as well. And there was an interesting one here where uh, where's the balance between specifying sustainably and having a drop in performance or an increase in, in price. Nick, how do you balance all of those those things? Yeah, it's, it is very difficult, Stephen. Um, you know, as, as, as I mentioned before, the, the, the last project I worked on, it was, you know, we wanted to specify the really sustainable materials, um, but uh, the, the, the difference in cost and in some cases the performance uh, just meant that they weren't practical for the project that we were looking at. Um, so, you know, the will is definitely there, um, but I think, you know, the industry needs to, to, to kind of realise that at some point something's going to have to give if these products are ever going to be specified um, consistently across the board. And, and probably is, this, is there sort of, a, sort of a compromise on projects at the moment where you, you have your sustainability aspirations and it, it lands somewhere in between what's your experience um yeah i think so we are definitely driving you know to, to be obviously net zero and all of those criteria and um it's also you know i think it's a client investors objective as well uh that kind of drives this and you know makes all of these products um specified and and used but as you have you mentioned that yes price could be a huge factor and um, also about you know kind of comparing you know what, what which product is more sustainable um and uh, uh, yeah when it gets subbed as well and and, and yeah but there are a few factors but definitely we are trying to drive it yes and so the third party certification things like BSI kind mark certifier secure by design B, 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 B is, is is this something that you you ask from uh, the manufacturers you specify pretty and is it more on certain types of products um yes definitely um I think it's um quite essential on most of the products and uh, we do call out for I think I think it's great well you know kind of called out in every class in MBS chorus as well which uh, really uh, helps uh, to kind of highlight that and it's usually for you know products that are not really a simple process products but something that um, would kind of be a bit more complex or something that you know a whole system maybe that needs a certification um and that's very important really um so it's you know you comply with the standard and you have a or you have a yeah a certification uh, as well and i guess nick when you talk about those more complex systems like maybe an entire cladding system or roofing system or door sets it's not just the, I guess, the system certification, but a, a, a registered installer and the sort of documentation you want to see that shows that you're getting the quality that, that you require. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, uh, with us both being um, insured by the REN, this is, this is the kind of information that we're required to hold and demonstrate, you know, that um, at specification, specification stage, we had that information. Um, yeah, and, and follow through to the installation on site. So we're getting, you know, uh, installation certificates, et cetera. All of that information really, you know, kind of for us is essential now. 
yeah. And again, this comes up in every every time we do a product information survey in terms of where you specify a particular product and it gets substituted. Are you finding the processes around that are quite transparent and get signed off properly? Or do you find on certain projects that it just things get swapped without you knowing? Maybe Preti? Um, yeah, it's uh, it does happen. Um, I think um, it's um, uh, on every, yeah, it depends. I mean, but it does definitely happen on every project. Uh, it, it does obviously depend on the type of uh, contract it is, maybe. Um, but um, yeah, we, we do review uh, the subs, um, and it's it's not necessarily a bad thing, really. And uh, David mentioned the, the the Building Safety Act and what we expect to see from secondary legislation around tracking changes and keeping that golden thread. Do, do you think that will improve things, Nick? Yeah, absolutely, Stephen. You know, as as Pretty's already said, you know, reviewing um, equivalent products um, is essential, but you know, now keeping a record of um, those products and um, the instructions that sit behind them, you know, who made that decision? Where did that come from? Did the client make the decision or was it uh, contractor driven? You know, uh, our insurance company will be will be really keen to see the, the kind of um, the background to all of those uh, key changes in terms of product specification and, and uh, substitution. Yeah, I guess, in like both practices being members of like the, the REN group as well. Like, I guess you're, you're sort of closely looking at that secondary legislation and seeing what the definitions of gateway two, gateway three, I think it's a notifiable change or major changes. To, uh, uh, are you having those discussions internally, uh, uh, Freddie, and also with a sort of wider group of uh, architects? Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, we have uh, Dieter, uh, the head of technical yeah. um, here, and um, yes, definitely, we are having a quite close look, and I think um, there are updates as well, I think, today. <laughs> uh, we, um, uh, yeah, I think it's, 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 it's a, a good and um, very interesting change is talking about uh, what's on screen. It's um, going to definitely, yeah. Um, affect uh, every aspect uh, of um, the way uh, we kind of prescribe documents, the information um, as built uh, information that we need to record, building digital data, testing certification, all of that um, uh, will be, you know, needs to be kind of captured. And um, yeah, it's, it's going to be a good uh, change here. Yeah. yeah, I think from MBS point of view, we're about sort of trying to sort of shine a light on the technical information, getting the documentation correct, and then storing the revisions to the spec. So through the timeline, any sort of final thoughts on Building Safety Act, Nick? Um, yeah, I mean, for me, you know, the, the kind of holistic um, suite of documents that um, come along with products is going to be absolutely key to them being specified. You know, uh, moving forward, if if we don't have all of that information to hand when we're, you know, putting a spec together, then products simply aren't going to be specified, Stephen. You know, uh, we can't evidence um, at that stage, you know, we've done due diligence, then, then we will be looking for a, a manufacturer, a product that does have all of that information. So it is kind of, you know, bringing all of these pieces of information together and ensuring that, you know, before a project's even started on site, it, it it's all there and it's all readily available to to be reviewed by, you know, clients, insurers, whoever, whoever wants to see it. Yeah, no, well, thank you very much for your uh, your, your time today, uh, Pretty and Nick, and thanks for the presentation, uh, David as well. We now move on to the final part of today's webinar. So what we'll do now just to finish off the webinars, uh, just have a little look at uh, NBS and how we position manufacturers' product information to, to specifiers. So you heard a little bit in the discussion in David's presentation about NBS source. Like we, we've got 
well-structured product information from about 1200 manufacturers now on MBS source. Uh, if you know a manufacturer you're interested in, you can just sort of start uh, typing and, and jump straight to that manufacturer's page and all of the information's in the same location, no matter the manufacturer. So we go here to store, you can look at the case studies, product literature, third party certification, and all of their, their, their sort of products uh, as well. But if you're not sure about exactly which manufacturer uh, product uh, you're interested in or you want to do some research, you can also search for sort of free text or specific categories. So if I'm interested in this sort of uh, wood window units, you can start to type. It, it's, it's best if you can pick a category because everything's classified the same. And then you can come and say uh, which sort of uh, things you're interested in. Uh, see when was the last time that the manufacturer sort of verified the content so you know you trust it's up to date. And you can even compare product information between manufacturers. So you can come here and say pick uh, two or three manufacturers. And just like you sort of what you typically see on the likes of Amazon or John Lewis, you can look across. And because we've standardized the information, you can uh, have a little look, see how something like the air permeability or water tightness compares between uh, one or two uh, diff different manufacturers. And then jump in and look at all of the the, the product information uh, about that particular product. Talk a little bit about uh, uh, digital objects, uh, Revit objects, uh, and the like. Everything from the National BIM Library has been moved across now inside of NBS Source. So one of the main calls to action there is if the manufacturer does have a BIM object, you can just click that button and and, and download it. In addition to that, inside the, the, the plugin for Autodesk Revit, uh, this is now got the MBS source brand at the top, but uh, you can still come and uh, search and all the products that you find inside here have, uh, have objects. So if I just sort of uh, jump across to the sort of deck and area of, of this project here, I could come and find a particular product that I want and just drag it uh, straight into the 3D 3D model here. So bring across a particular uh, bench here from the manufacturer, uh, Brox app. I'm not positioning this particularly nicely, but you saw so drop that in there and you could do that the same. Let's scroll down a little bit further. Let's uh, pull this one in as well. And you're taking it straight from the cloud. Uh, that information has been provided uh, by the manufacturer and dropping it uh, straight in to, to the design. Once it's gone into the uh, model itself, you've got the well-structured information here, and it also synchronizes with the guidance, the latest guidance uh, on the right-hand side as well. So. We talk about BIM being building information modeling. The, 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 this information here is uh, at your fingertips as you put uh, that design together. And the other additional information that uh, we looked at was the uh, EPD certificates. So if I go to, I think this manufacturer has uh, good examples. So I think it's a carpet tile manufacturer. If I go to look at their products, I can say, just show me the products that have uh, the EPD certificates and then uh, jump across and have a little look uh, at this particular carpet tile from Bermatex and uh, they're clearly the top, it's got the EPD certificate and drop down. You've got the certificate itself, which is the PDF and a little bit higher, you have that, that sort of uh, environmental information which has been extracted from the EPD. And we've been improving this this year, so it's actually got the declared units and you've got numeric values in and what the country you have uh, material origin uh, in is, is as well. We talk about third party certifications, manufacturer and put that, uh, manufacturers can put this up as well. So let's uh, do a search for a, a cavity tray 
and say, I'd just like to see Cavity Traders has a BBA certificate or what have you. I'm just filtering by the verified information again. And then there's three uh, Cavity Traders uh, that have BBA certificates. And the principles are the same as the, the, the EPDs there, where you can sort of come in uh, clearly at the top, it says what third party certification you've got, and you're going to drop down there and just sort of grab a hold of that PDF and just modeling where that came from, what sort of certificate it is, and when it was actually uh, issued uh, as, as, as well. Uh, in addition to the manufacturer's information appearing in source, it also appears in uh, a chorus as well as specification tool. You heard Nick. Uh, and Pretty talking about. So if I come into MBS Chorus as a specifier, writing a, a specification, in this example for a sort of office refurbishment, when I come down to that particular product type, so in this case, a, a window unit, you've got all of the generic guidance and links to standards from the manif from the sort of things like BSI on the right hand side, where you could specify generically if you wished, but also if you come into the that the manufacturer feel that all of the products, mm -hmm. product clauses and MBS have. As you come in here, you see uh, a list of the different manufacturers. So I can quickly filter there to show like, just the manufacturers from the windows from uh, Rationale, for example. And then if that's the, the product you want, you, you just sort of click that button and it sort of drops into your specification. And then uh, you can complete that specification looking at the the guidance uh, from the manufacturer on the right hand side there. Uh, so just want to show uh, one, one, one final thing. If there's any questions, please ask them in the, the, the chat because I want to try and keep this within the hour, but we get back to everybody afterwards. But uh, one final thing. So, so one, one final thing around the building holding uh, safety act was we, we worked with the construction Product Association to help research and then develop what's called the Code for Construction Product Information. So this is a free download uh, get from the CPA website. We, we have a guide to it on the MPS. You search, search Google. Yeah, if that, you can find it. But there's lots and lots of sort of good recommendation on how manufacturers should put clear, up to date uh, product information in front of their decision makers like specifiers, designers, in terms of things like performance claims, the language that you use, uh, things like third party certification, uh, put the technical characteristics nicely clearly up there, having linked information like installation managed uh, and manuals and warranties, et cetera, and clear technical support. So we try and do this in NBS uh, source. So just jumping across any manufacturer that uh, is an MBS source. Let's just go back and look at the, this, this example page here, go all the way to the top. We, we've tried to make that technical information and the support information as clear as possible. So you can see right from the top how the product's classified, when was the last time the manufacturer sort of verified uh, that information, the confirmation it's not four or five years uh, out of date. Uh, it's very easy to get technical support. So you just click that button and you go straight to the, the, the manufacturer's technical support contact detail. Uh, the third party certification, clearly right at the top with the hyperlink down the page. And then really clear guidance, first and foremost, like before you even get to that sort of description of the product on what this product is suitable for. So what, what are the, what's the application guidance? And then coming down the page, uh, how it's classified against different classification systems, and then that clear technical information before finally at the bottom uh, links to the, the connected literature and that third party certs uh, at the bottom. So I think in summary, what specifiers want is the high quality technical information and then link to that things like certificates, uh, digital objects uh, as well. And that confirmation that that information is, is, is accurate uh, and current. So hopefully it's been a useful uh, webinar today. Uh, at the end of every webinar, the first thing I always do is go back and look through all of the questions that have came through. So please pop any feedback in the chat uh, now. 
uh, visit the mbs.com to find out how we can help uh, support support you in terms of getting product information in front of specifiers. Uh, the full report uh, that uh, David presented from uh, is available to download. I think there's a short URL, the mbs.com forward slash WSW. Uh, but we will include that in the follow up email as well. And uh, you can always email us as well at uh, manufacturers at the mbs.com. So thank you very much and bye bye.